Tell me if you recognize the words that you're about to hear. We the people of the United States, in order to form a more perfect union, establish justice, ensure domestic tranquility, provide for the common defense, promote the general welfare, and secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and our posterity, do ordain the establishment of this Constitution for the United States of America. Now, I would ask you what document those words are from, but the answer is kind of right there in front of you. Those are the words, of, the opening words of our nation's Constitution. In the several paragraphs that we call articles that follow, this document establishes the presidency, the Senate, the House of Representatives, and the Supreme Court. And after a few pages of that, you finally get to the amendments, the first 10 of which make up what we all call the Bill of Rights. And this part you probably know by heart, right? Article 1, freedom of what? Religion, speech, a free press, uh, the right to assemble peacefully and, and protest and challenge the government. Article 2, we all know this one probably by now, it's in constant debate, the right to bear arms and have state militias. Uh, Article 3, who knows Article 3? Nobody. Okay, that's fine. Article 3, the military can't come to your house and put soldiers in it, right? They can't quarter military folks in your house against your will. Article 4, illegal search and seizure. The government can't come and, and take your property and look through it without getting a warrant, and they can't get a warrant without probable cause, supposedly. Article 5, the fifth, right? I plead the fifth. You can't be forced to incriminate yourself in court, and you can't be tried twice for the same crime. And the list kind of goes on and on and on from there until you get all the way to Article 27, which has to do with how we can change the pay of senators and representatives. So you can see we started with the really important stuff and we worked our way down to the less important stuff. This Constitution is a founding and guiding document for the country that you live in. It expresses both literal, you know, to the letter, not open to interpretation kinds of laws, and it also communicates a system of, of ethics that undergirds every section of the entire document. In a sense, the Constitution expresses both a set of laws and rules and regulations, and it also expresses who we are as Americans, who we are as a country. It expresses some of what our, our chief concerns are, what our ideals are, what our hopes for the future even are. If someone ever wondered what America believes in and hopes to be, and you didn't know how to answer that question, pointing them back to the Constitution would be a great way to start. Now, this is not a unique truth about our set of laws. This is probably true for any set of laws in any society. If you look at their charter, if you look at their Constitution, if you look at their declarations, their founding documents, you will probably find the values the ideals, the priorities, and the hopes and the fears of any particular group. Now for the Jewish population of Jesus' time, going back to first century Jerusalem and all of the regions that surrounded it, the Torah, the Old Testament scriptures of Moses, was their system of laws. What the Constitution is to us, the Torah was to them, except even more significant because a lot of Americans live not knowing a single word of the Constitution, but if you were a first century Jew, you had better know your Torah. It was given to them by Yahweh himself. This ancient code of laws contained both a system of down to the letter, not open to interpretation kinds of rules and regulations, but it also communicated their ethics. It communicated God's ethics for his people, the way that they were to live and view the world. And faithfulness to God was largely understood as faithfulness to the Torah. An entire culture of scribes and teachers, primarily, by the way, Pharisees and Sadducees, grew up and, and formed together to teach the Jewish world what these laws said, what they meant, how to obey them in their own context, in their own contemporary context, and, and what true faithfulness to the Torah laws meant. And today, as we get into the, the body of the Sermon on the Mount, in Matthew chapter 5, verses 17 through 20, 
we will get to see the beginning of what Jesus taught about Torah faithfulness. So those Pharisees and Sadducees grew up and had their own interpretation of how to obey the law. But today we'll see what Jesus said about the right way to be faithful to Torah, the right way to live out obedience to the law. So with scribes and Pharisees and Sadducees listening in to the lesson and the conversation, Jesus will make some of his most powerful statements about the law in these verses, what it is and what it means for his people. So our first major point is simply Jesus and the Torah. And the first thing that Jesus is going to tell us about the Torah in Matthew 5.17 is simply how important the law is. Because the first words of this, this teaching are, do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. And we should know right off the bat that this might actually be Jesus responding to some of his critics. We know that Jesus had a lot of detractors in his time. And a common complaint about him, based off what we see in the Gospels, seems to be that he was, he was teaching the Torah in a different way from the scribes and Pharisees. And in their mind, in their perception of things, he was teaching people that the law was no longer the most important thing and that they could live outside of the law that the law somehow had been degraded in importance, that it was outdated and needed to be replaced. And it might be that Jesus is responding to them right here by starting with, I have not come to abolish the law and the prophets. And consider what that word abolish means. It's, it's to destroy something, to overthrow it, to end it. What is an abolitionist? Someone who fought against slavery, to abolish Slavery, they wanted it ended, they wanted it done, they wanted it replaced with something else. So when Jesus uses that word, I've not come to abolish, he's saying, I haven't come to replace it, I haven't come to tear it down, I haven't come to overthrow it. Jesus is making it clear to his disciples that the law still has a, a very living, very alive, and important role. It's not his mission to dismantle it, but as he mentions in this next phrase, his ministry does give the law a new meaning. We're still in verse 17. So he just said, I've not come to abolish the law and prophets. And then Jesus says, I have come not to abolish them, but to fulfill them. So the law and the prophets have not lost their importance, but they've taken on a new role. They mean something different now with the arrival of Jesus. I've not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. What does that even mean? How does one man, one God-man, how does someone fulfill the law? Well, it means a few different things. First of all, uh, it means that he lives out or he expresses in his actions, in his life, in his teachings, all of the ideals of the Torah law. Everything that Jesus says and does and expresses takes all of those ideas that are communicated through the Old Testament laws. Remember, we said laws are both regulations and they communicate ideas and, and ethics. Takes all of that and he brings it into the world in the way that he teaches and the way that he lives. So he takes stuff from the realm of ideas, stuff from the realm of, of language and written law, and he brings it into the world by the way that he lives and, and interacts with other people. And as we go through the Gospels, and we discover or rediscover the stories of Jesus' earthly ministry, we will see all of the different ways that the Torah is, is fulfilled through him. We get to see it when Jesus heals the sick. We get to see it when Jesus extends mercy and forgiveness onto his enemies, especially at the cross. We get to see it when Jesus feeds the hungry. We get to see it when Jesus is obedient. Sorry about that. <laughs> obedient to the Father. We get to see it when Jesus goes to the cross as our atoning sacrifice. Right? What's one of the biggest, most central parts of the entire Old Testament system of laws? It's the sacrificial system. Perhaps the biggest way that Jesus fulfills the law is that he is the once for all sacrifice. The book of Hebrews has some really good stuff on that if you care to read it. So the law and prophets then not only told the nation of Israel how to live communally, as God's people, 
the kind of ethics they were supposed to have, how they were supposed to take care of each other, how they were supposed to be obedient to God. But it also told them what the most ideal Israelite would be like. It told them without explicitly saying what the Messiah would be like. Because the Messiah, remember, he's the perfect Israelite. He's the second Moses. He's the one who is faithful to the law more than anybody else. Jesus is that perfectly faithful Israelite. He is the utmost, maximum, ideal Jewish man. His practice of the law models exactly what God wants from his people, what he wants from his people when they obey the law. Because everything he does is shaped by the central ethics of that Torah law. Now, to make sort of an illustration, I want you to stop and think. We started with the Constitution, right? So what would the most ideal American citizen be based on the ethics of the Constitution? What would someone be like? if they took from the articles of the Constitution all of the, the central ethics and, and, and the mode of law there and worked it into their lifestyle? Would this ultimate American perhaps live out the ethics of the Constitution by standing up for free speech all the time, everywhere? Would he uphold the Senate and the Congress and the presidency and the Supreme Court and the Electoral College as these revered and sort of sacred institutions built in by our founders? He'd take these things really seriously. The ideal American, according to the Constitution, would uplift people out of slavery and help guide them into lives of freedom and liberty, Amendment 13. This ideal American would ensure that everyone had access to the right to vote, Amendment 14, and Amendment 19, slaves and women, respectively. This ideal American would defend to the utmost the right to keep and bear arms and be in state militias. I am sure that you're getting the idea. This, this ultimate, this maximum American would live out these ethics of freedom and liberty and civic responsibility that are built into our system of laws that are that are part of the mixture of the Constitution. Everything in this American's life would be filtered through the values and the institutions of that single founding and guiding document. Now take that illustration, that ridiculously, insanely American American, and replace the Constitution with the law and the prophets. Replace that ultimate American with the ultimate Israelite. Okay, replace the values and ethics of our Constitution, you know, all the voting and the right to bear arms and on and on and on, and replace it with the central ethics of the Torah law. What's that person like? What does that person do for the poor? What does that person think about religious righteousness? What does that person do with their wealth and their property? And, and, and how do they look out for the sick? How do they pray? That person that ultimate Israelite, the most Israelite Israelite, that person is Jesus. All of the justice and the mercy and the religious righteousness and all of the concern for love and, and taking care of the poor and the stranger and the widow and the absolute and complete and total love and devotion to God that make up the central ethics and ideas of the Old Testament's teachings through the Law and Prophets are built into the actions and the ethics of Jesus. Jesus exemplifies and expresses all of those ideas in everything that he does and everything that he teaches. So that's one way that he fulfills the laws. He takes all of the ideas and the ideals of the Law and Prophets and through his teachings and through his actions brings them into existence. Another way he fulfills it is he's the authoritative, the single authoritative teacher of the law. So the way that Jesus teaches about the law and prophets, that's the one authoritative teaching by which God's people should live. Remember, Jesus lived in a time and place that was filled with rabbis and scribes trying to teach others about what the law and prophets say and about how they should react to that, how they should live that out. 
But the only teacher out of all of them who could do this with any real authority is Jesus. And Jesus, of course, being God, understands the law and prophets better than any other human teacher who had ever existed before him who, or who will ever exist after him. He certainly understands it better than I do. Matthew really captures that, by the way, right at the end of the Sermon on the Mount in chapter 7, verses 28 and 29. Matthew writes, when Jesus finished these sayings, the whole Sermon on the Mount, the crowds were astonished at his teaching, for he was teaching them as one who had authority and not as their scribes. So the people who heard Jesus teach on the law and prophets knew, oh, this is the one guy who gets it. This is the one guy who can really teach us this with any real meaning and authority. And it's important that we stop now and recognize this because most of the rest of the Sermon on the Mount will be these very specific lessons about the law and about how we should then live coming from Jesus. And we need to know that these are not just the sayings of some really good teacher, of, of a particular scribe who was really wise and well-read. These are not the sayings of some religious sage. These are lessons that come to us from the only teacher who could teach the law with real and direct authority because he's the only teacher who actually owns the law. The law is built by his heart and his wisdom. The very ethics of God, who Jesus is, are built into the guiding principles of the Old Testament law. So when he teaches about it, that's the final authoritative word on it. He literally wrote the book. When he interprets the law, that's the interpretation. There's no other that someone needs to listen to. What he emphasizes about the law is truly the most important thing. And what he lets be sort of secondary are the most truly secondary things. What Jesus says about the ethics of the law matter more than any other teacher because they come from his very heart. In Matthew 22, verses 36 through 40, Someone asked Jesus this almost impossible to answer sort of question. Someone comes to him and says, Teacher, what's the greatest commandment? And for anybody else, that would have been impossible to answer. For any other scribe or teacher of the law, they would have had to try to search in their memory banks every letter of the law and find the one that, that most spoke to them. Find the most important, directly applicable law. But Jesus, because he owns the law, because it belongs to him, and he understands the ethics of it better than anyone who's ever lived, even better than Moses, only points to two teachings. First, he goes to what's called the Shema, a command from God to Moses that is chronicled in Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 4 through 5. And Jesus' answer takes part of that and echoes it. Jesus says, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment an ancient and revered commandment in the Jewish world. But then, he says, there's another commandment like it that is of equal importance. This one comes from Leviticus, chapter 19, verse 18. Jesus says, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. So what do we see at play here? How does Jesus seem to think about the ethics of the law? Someone asked him point blank, out of all of the Old Testament scriptures, what they understood to be the Bible, out of the entire Bible that we have in the first century, what's the most important part? What's the part that I need to walk away with and hang on to and remember more than anything else? And what did Jesus tell him? Love the Lord your God. Love your neighbor. The ethical thrust of the law that Jesus understands better than anybody else is nothing less than, but also nothing more than, a complete devotion and submission towards God and a lifestyle of self-giving towards neighbor. And Jesus goes on to say in response to that question, what's the greatest commandment? That on these two ideas, on these two commandments, hang all the law and the prophets. The entire corpus of the Old Testament depends on these two delicate ideas.
Only someone who has the authority of God could make a claim like that. To tell someone that the entire Old Testament boils down to these two things. And that without them, we have nothing. Only someone who is completely immersed in every word of the law and prophets could say that. Everything that the law demanded of God's people and everything that the prophets were trying to tell God's people. Because remember, that's the number one job of a prophet. It's not to go up there and and tell the future, although they do some of that. The number one job of a prophet is to look at the community of God and say, guys, we're getting it wrong here and here and here. We're letting the widows and the children go hungry, but we're doubling up on sacrifices. Something doesn't quite add up. God's calling us back into faithfulness, right? That's a prophet's number one job. Isaiah chapter 1, verses 10 through 20. Great work on that. Micah 6, 8. Great work on that. Jesus takes that ethic, and he takes the entire body of the Old Testament, and he tries to tell the people of Israel, that's the thing you need to know. Everything that God's demanding of you, everything the prophets are trying to show you, everything that the prophets are telling you when they hold up that mirror to you as God's people and try to call you back into faithfulness is summarized in these two ideas. Total devotion to God, self-giving to neighbor. An impossible to answer question and an answer that only Jesus could give. And the third way that he fulfills all the law and prophets is that he is the fulfillment of all of the prophetic promises given to Israel. So in the Torah, in the prophets, there's so much hope. There's so much language and talk about this beautiful, blessed place that Israel will someday get to dwell. This unconquerable home from which they will never again be exiled. This place, this time where they will get to live in a face-to-face relationship with God. This time, this place, this dispensation where the law itself will be written on the hearts of the people. Jeremiah, Zechariah, Isaiah, they all point very vividly to this special time and place. There's so much hope written into the law and prophets that someday God would come for his people and that the paradise that was lost in Genesis 3 would finally become real again. Jesus fulfills the law because he is the conduit through which all of those blessings must travel. He is the fruit of the promise given to Abraham all the way back in Genesis chapter 12, verse 3. Really the beginning of Israel's history as a people. God's promise to Abraham that in you all the families of the earth will be blessed. That promise is fulfilled through Jesus Christ and only Jesus. And every promise given to Israel is in orbit around the first and second comings of Jesus. His first coming, right, brought the kingdom of God to to the world in part. His second coming brings the fullness of that kingdom, brings those end times promises given to Israel, brings the millennial kingdom set up in Jerusalem, ultimately brings the new world where that that face-to-face life with God is finally made real. Jesus summarizes all of this in Matthew 11, verses 4 through 6, right? The scene is that some of the disciples of John the Baptist, they come and they find Jesus because John's been in prison. And now John's getting a little bit anxious about whether or not he was right when he pointed out Jesus and said, this is the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. So these disciples of John the Baptist go and find Jesus and they say, hey, um, John's getting a little worried back in prison and he needs to know, dude, are you... Are you the guy, or is there another guy that we need to wait for? And Jesus' answer to them is this. He says, go and tell John what you hear and see. The blind receive their sight, the lame walk, lepers are cleansed, and the deaf hear, and the dead are raised up, and the poor have good news preached to them. And blessed is the one who's not offended by me. Jesus' answer is essentially that the Torah The ethics of Torah and the prophets are being fulfilled. Because when the prophets called to Israel, their main concern was, we are ignoring the poor, we're ignoring the weak, 
We're oppressing those who, who aren't part of the central temple complex and all that. And Jesus tells these disciples, go back and tell John the Baptist that the poor, the marginalized, the, the disabled, the sick, they're all being taken care of. And that, in fact, miracles are being performed to the extent that the dead are rising. The poor, the marginalized, are receiving blessings from God and hearing the good news. The utmost ideals of the prophets are being brought into reality. The hopes of the law are being brought into the world and they are walking the earth in this single person, Jesus. So yeah, he is the guy. And you don't need to wait for another guy. And John, I'm sorry you're in prison, but these things happen. So what's the implication of all this stuff? All right, kind of the so what. What, what does it mean for, for us to observe Jesus saying he fulfills the law and prophets and have all these different talks and go in these different directions. Well, the implication is that Jesus is essentially saying in, in Matthew 5.17 that all of the law and all of the prophets weren't just a message to Israel at that time. They weren't just something important for Israel to hear at that time. Of course, they were that, but they also have this new role, this newly fulfilled role that they point forward to Jesus. When Jesus says, I've not come to abolish the law and prophets, but to fulfill them, what he's saying is, all of those writings that you guys revere, that you teach about, that you love, that you've heard from the time you were little boys and little girls into adulthood, they point to me. They point forward to my arrival in this world. The law and prophets tell you what the Messiah is going to be like, and now I'm here. If you want proof of my Messiahship, of my real status as the Savior, all you need to do is take all those ethics of the law and prophets and look at how I live and see the connection. Because all the ideas of the law and prophets point forward to me. That's Jesus speaking, not me. The law and prophets do not point to me. So, when Jesus says he fulfills the law and prophets, remember, that's done in three ways. He's the ultimate expression of them. He's the authoritative teacher of them. And he is the ultimate fulfillment of them, that is, the promises. And perhaps the most obvious one is like we talked about the sacrificial system. And Jesus is the once-for-all sacrifice for all humankind. So that's Jesus' relationship to the Torah, right? It's one of fulfillment. But then... He continues on and he starts to talk about what our relationship to the Torah law is. What our relationship to the law and prophets is, is his people, his disciples. There's a huge crowd listening to this, but scripture tells us this teaching was meant for his disciples. For those who had risen their hands and said, I will follow Jesus. So our second major point is the church and the Torah. And we'll go to verses 18 and 19. For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not an iota, not a dot, will pass from the law until all is accomplished. Therefore, whoever relaxes one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does them and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. So if Jesus fulfills the law, his disciples are called on to affirm the law and uphold it. So the Torah has had this role that's now clearly different with the arrival of Jesus, but it is still something to be cherished, right? It doesn't stop being the authoritative word of God just because Jesus is now here. It's important for us to know that because it sometimes might seem that Jesus is teaching against the law, and that was obviously one of the accusations that was levied against him. But he's never teaching against the law, right? That would be in, in tension with what Jesus said about it, that, that he is here to, to fulfill it and that it's important and that it should be remembered. Jesus clearly affirms the law as something good. It's something that God's people should hear and seek to live in obedience, in obedience to. But what Jesus does is, is he reveals that obedience to the Torah, that obedience to the law and prophets is not necessarily what the scribes and Pharisees have been teaching 
when Jesus corrects, when he amends, when he rebukes these teachers of the law, he's not doing it to the law itself. He's doing it to the lawyers, to the ones who had been interpreting it and trying to teach it to others. So if his relationship to the law is fulfillment, ours is obedience. The law is something to be upheld and, and cherished. That is the Torah, the law and the prophets. And we might feel like that conflicts with some other parts of the New Testament, right? Because doesn't Paul write somewhere that we aren't under the authority of the law, that he died to the law, that the law brought death into his life? Well, let's talk about that. Uh, we can start by saying that Jesus' statement here is absolutely not contradicting anything else in the New Testament. Yes, Jesus affirms the importance of the Old Testament laws. It's the authoritative word of God. How else can he talk about it? How can we expect him to do anything but say that it's important and that it's truthful? But affirming the law and calling us into obedience to it doesn't tell us to be like the scribes and Pharisees. Right? We've already talked about how Jesus is the ultimate example of how to live out the law. Right? He is God. So his interpretation of the law is the one we should listen to. Jesus' actions show us how he thought about the law. His life, his ministry, is our best object lesson for how we as the church should live in faithfulness and obedience to the law and prophets that he is telling us are important. And as we'll see in the gospel stories that we're about to go to, the way Jesus lives out the Torah, the way that Jesus lives with the Torah in his mind and in his heart, puts him in tension with the scribes and Pharisees, which tells us right away that when Jesus calls us into obedience, he's not telling us to, to beat those guys at their own game. Some of the most popular stories about Jesus in opposition to the Pharisees have just to do with the Sabbath. Right? The Sabbath was this really big deal in first century Jewish life. It still is a big deal for a lot of Hasidic and, and Orthodox Jews. They still will not do labor on the Sabbath. In fact, someone told me a story once um, about a, I think it was a Hasidic Jew who was a hospital patient, and he would not turn the lights on on his own. He would call for a nurse to say, will you please turn the lights on for me? It's, it's the Sabbath, and that's, that is too much work. I will violate my religious law if I have to turn these lights on. So for some communities, the idea of Sabbath is still this really big deal. And it's not just Jewish people. I'm sure you've heard of what a Seventh-day Adventist is, right? They are within the, the Christian family, but they have this religious commitment to the idea of Sabbath. When I was at Azusa Pacific, I had a classmate who was from a Seventh-day Adventist family, and she explained to me how her family on Sundays, right, they do church on Saturday, um, and on Sunday, they are so committed to the idea of Sabbath that they don't cook, they don't clean. Their entire day in religious obedience to God is they just put on music and they hang out as a family. And, you know, they talk and they have coffee, which, of course, the coffee has to be made the day before. Um, and they just relax, right, because God told them to have a Sabbath. And this is their commitment to that, right? This is their faithfulness to God, that they will not even brew coffee on the Sabbath day. But how did Jesus think about Sabbath? How did Jesus live out the idea of Sabbath? Would Jesus have refused to turn the lights on on a Sabbath day? Well, if we go to Mark chapter 3, verses 1 through 6, we can see some of how Jesus thought about Sabbath. Right? In this scene, he's in the synagogue, and there's Pharisees all around him, right? The synagogue, by the way, is their place. It is the Pharisees' place because they didn't love going to the temple so much. So they set up these synagogues, kind of like house churches where the rabbis would teach them. So Jesus is in their place, and it's on the Sabbath, right? It's their important day of rest, and he's surrounded by critics. And a man comes forward with this withered hand. And now Jesus' enemies are watching him like hawks to see what he's going to do next. Because they know if he heals somebody on the Sabbath, that's work. He labored on the Sabbath, and no faithful Jew would work on the Sabbath. And Jesus knows what they're thinking, knows what's in their hearts. So he turns to them and, and he says, Is it lawful on the Sabbath to do good or do harm, to save or to kill? But they were silent. 
And he looked at them with anger, grieved at their hardness of heart. And he said to the man with the withered hand, stretch out your hand. He stretched it out, and his hand was restored. In Matthew's account of this same event, Jesus tells these Pharisees after the healing, it is lawful to do good on the Sabbath. Remember when I said that the things Jesus emphasizes about the law are the truly important things and the things that he lets be secondary are the truly secondary things? For these first century Jews, the idea of Sabbath had become like a prison. They were living in what they thought was obedience and faithfulness to God, right? They were not doing this out of some perverted ethic. In their minds, this is how they were faithful to the law and therefore faithful to the God of Israel, to the God who had brought them out of exile all those centuries ago, who had all these prophetic promises for them. And yet Jesus is standing here telling them, no, 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 the ethics of the law and prophets are to take care of the poor, are to do good for others, to heal, to make whole. And you're letting the Sabbath get in the way of that. These central ideas of the law are more important than the rituals. We can see it also when Jesus dines with sinners. One of the main complaints people had about Jesus in his time is that he sat at table with sinners, dirty people, and tax collectors. People who would not be allowed in or appreciated in the temple. Jesus laments about it in Mark chapter 2, verses 16 through 17, which shows us Pharisees watching Jesus eat with sinners. And they're all grousing about it, and they're, they're mad about it because, oh, how can this guy claim to be a teacher of the law and eat with people like this? And Jesus turns to them and answers, Those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. I came not to call the righteous, but the sinners. So Jesus points out their own self-righteousness. Right? They think they're living in obedience. They're really living in self-righteousness. And Jesus calls them on it. He says, you're so convinced of your own holiness. You're so convinced of your own glory to God and all of that. And yet here's where you should have been. Here's where you should have been sitting at the table with these poor people. Not convincing yourself of your own righteousness, but helping others to discover righteousness, perhaps for the first time. Your specific Pharisaical, Sadducee, scribe, whatever interpretation of the law is inaccurate. And then Jesus rebukes them for it. The Gospels are full of events like this that show us how Jesus lives out true obedience, true faithfulness to the law and prophets, to the Torah. Jesus, remember, the same guy who sat at the well with an adulterous Samaritan, oh my goodness, a Samaritan woman, who was unwelcome in Jerusalem, much less the temple. Jesus, who, who touched and healed unclean lepers, who got their filthy, awful, dirty skin on his hands and under his fingernails, and healed them, and then went into the temple. Jesus, who let a sinful woman anoint him, an awful sinful woman, a nasty woman, anoint him with oil on his feet, anoint him and, and prepare him for burial. At the offense of the Pharisees, who said if he was really a prophet, he'd know who she is, and he wouldn't let her touch him. The man who did all of those things, the man who did those things and drove the Pharisees nearly insane to the point where they plotted to kill him, that is our ultimate object lesson for Torah obedience. And his faithfulness to the law is so radically different than the faithfulness, quote unquote, of all of the scribes and Pharisees and Sadducees and all the other groups who were around him. Jesus' faithfulness to the Torah is different because his understanding of it is so much deeper and so much more profound than everybody else in his time, this time, or any other time. So when Jesus tells us that not a single stroke, a single pen stroke of the law passes away until the end of this age, he doesn't call us back into legalism. He doesn't call us into Pharisaism or anything like that. He's not calling us to be like the scribes. He's calling us to be like him. So yeah, you can flip a light switch on Sunday as long as you take care of the poor. You can brew coffee on Sunday morning and go to church on a Sunday instead of Saturday 
as long as you remember to heal the sick. He's not calling us to legalism. He's calling us to Christ-likeness. And he's telling us that the whole law and prophets call us into Christ-likeness. The way Jesus lives, the way he taught, is our authoritative guide to a lifestyle of obedience to the Torah and to the prophets. He shows us in what he does and what he says all of the ethics that God is demanding from his people, mercy and love and justice, total devotion to God and total love of neighbor on these two ideas depend all the law and prophets. It's not ritual purity that God is looking for. It's purity in heart. It's not self-righteousness that God is looking for. He's calling on us to accept the righteousness that comes from the blood of the cross. It's not works that he's calling us into. It's faithfulness. It's not circumcision of the flesh that he's asking for, but circumcision of the heart. And it has to be this. It has to be this because if it's not this, then is it really even good news? Right? Remember... I hope you do, because we preached on it for long enough. Remember the book of Acts? <laughs> it's there. There's this thing that happens called the Jerusalem Council, where all of these elders of the church are getting together, and they're arguing about whether or not gen new Gentile converts should have to essentially become Jews. Big problem in early Christianity. And the ruling that comes down is that our God is not a God of legalism. That, yeah, they need to know the ethics of the law and the prophets, and there's some behaviors over here that need some correction. But by becoming Christians, we shouldn't put upon them a yoke that they've never experienced before that was too heavy even for our forefathers to uphold. Right? That's expressed here in what Jesus is telling us about the law and prophets. It's expressed here in the fact that he doesn't call us into legalistic lifestyles, but Christ-like lifestyles. Does this all make sense? That conversion is circumcision here and nowhere else? So knowing this, right, having this at the forefront of our minds, we can arrive now at Matthew chapter 5, verse 20, without fear, and without anxiety about our particular religious righteousness, without temptation to go and become strict legalists and start calling out everybody around us? Because this is what verse 20 says. For I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Now, because of all the stuff we've talked about already, we know that when Jesus says this, he's not telling them, look at the scribes and Pharisees, be like that, but like more. Like be more of that. We have to, he's not telling us we have to take on their understanding of religious righteousness because he's been showing us all through his life and ministry that their understanding of righteousness and faithfulness is wrong. It, it, it's inaccurate because he's not in it. Remember, it's not the law that Jesus comes up against when he rebukes the Pharisees. It's what they did to the law. I think that's what Paul is teaching against in Romans also. It's not the law that's evil. It's what people did to it. It's not righteousness of, of their kind that Jesus is demanding. It's righteousness that he, as God in the flesh, the inventor of the law, understands it. And that's a righteousness that he shows us how to live out. A righteousness centered on total devotion to God. Defined by true faithfulness to the word of God. Righteousness that doesn't make us prisoners to the law, which is what the scribes and Pharisees had become, but righteousness that lets the ethics of the law and prophets, of the word of God, enter our minds and our hearts and, and reform them, transform them, make them something else, change the way that we think about the world and the way that we look at things. What Jesus is telling us in these verses is that we as the church, we as his disciples, as God's people, we're to be so immersed, so sunken in the law and prophets that they take root 
in our worldview, and they shape how we think about things. That we as God's people are to be washed in the blood of Jesus and know that only through that are we justified and made pure. That is the righteousness that Jesus is telling us we have to have. That's the righteousness that exceeds all others, exceeds the righteousness of the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the scribes and fill in the blank. That's the example that Jesus himself gives us. That's kingdom living. That's what God is demanding of his people. And you don't have to accept this idea, this teaching, this reading with any fear or anxiety because we also know that God hasn't left us to understand and do all of this on our own. Right? God hasn't told you, be righteous, and then sent you into the arena to go and do on your own. We have the very Spirit of God who comes and, and, and sanctifies the people of God as soon as they make their confession of faith. And yeah, it's a lifelong journey, one that we will sort of constantly be taking steps towards faithfulness and then steps away and then repenting and then taking steps toward again. There's that interplay of the grace of God there, but this is the righteousness that we're called into. It's a journey that you don't have to take alone. God is constantly putting his hand out there saying, come, come, come into this lifestyle of, of righteousness, of Christ-likeness. Come into this lifestyle that's concerned for the poor. Come into this lifestyle that loves my word. Come into this lifestyle that honors marriage and all of these other things. We're transformed by the Spirit of God, not through our own hard work. Remember Matthew 28, 20. He is with us always until the end of this age. This is our last note for the day. So Chris, you can come up at any time. Oh, and the rest of the band too. The vocalists, our beloved vocalists. Let's just zoom out on the Sermon on the Mount for a minute here. Because what comes after 520, Matthew 520, is this long series of very specific teachings. Right? So we're going to talk about things like anger and lust and divorce and oaths and loving and praying for enemies. All kinds of stuff is contained in here. And they help to sort of fill out the kind of righteousness that Jesus is asking for. But I want us to take a minute just to look at the things that Jesus said before he started talking about these specific issues and before he started talking about the law. Remember verses 13 through 16. Jesus told his disciples... You're two things. You're the salt of the earth, and you're the light of the world. You are meant to make others thirsty for God, thirsty for living water. You are a people who reflect the glory of God and show others what the people of God are like. I don't think it's an accident or it's a coincidence that those verses are there before we start to learn about the law and before we start to, to get these very specific teachings. Jesus sets us up as salt and light and then tells us what the ethics of the law, what the ethics of God are like, what the worldview of the people of God should be like. And consider just for a moment that your ethics, your worldview, how you think about and react to things can themselves be missionary tools that when the world says pornography is not a problem, we as the people of God stand up and say it devalues the women and men who are involved in it. It's part of a global network of, of human trafficking. It breaks up marriages. That we are the voices that run counter to the voices that, shall we say, come out of Babylon. That when the world says, when the world says something like, oh, Human trafficking is not that big of a deal. We are the ones who tell the stories of those who are hurt by it. We are the ones who call other communities back into faithfulness and call them to take care of the poor. Our, our ethics, the way we think about the world, can mark us out as missionaries because inevitably they will come up against the memes and the modes of the world. People will undoubtedly notice that you think and live like Jesus. It's part of our missional life.
So our next step. Sorry to call you guys up here so early. I thought I'd be done with that faster. Our next step is to question this week how we define faithfulness and righteousness. Is the way that we define it the same as the way Jesus defines it? Think this week about situations where you can live out the ethics of the law and the prophets. Remember, that's mercy, love, charity, justice, that total devotion vertically to God, and love horizontally to neighbor. That's our next step for this week. So let's pray. Dear Jesus, thank you for... Thank you for being the fulfillment of the law for your people. Thank you for being the agent who delivers on the promises of all of those prophets. Thank you for being the embodiment of what the law calls your people into. All the ideas and the behaviors that are contained within them are embodied in you, Jesus. And we thank you for teaching us how to be obedient and how to be faithful to the word that you gave to Moses and that your people have carried on for centuries, even until now. Lord, thank you for showing us what true righteousness looks like so that no Pharisee, no Sadducee, no scribe, no lawyer or anything else could trick us into following their patterns when we really should be following you. Lord, we are the poor. We are the sick. We are the hurt and the broken, and we thank you that one of the central ethics of your law is concern for people like us. Thank you for making us whole. Thank you for casting out demons. Thank you for bringing us together as a people and calling us into faithfulness. Lord, I pray that as individuals and a community, we grow up to model your life your idea of the law, your idea of Torah faithfulness, more and more and more. Let us now be the ones who are concerned for the poor, who heal the sick, who make people whole again. Bless us, Lord, with the ability to do this in our own time, in our own place that you've brought us into. In your glorious name, Jesus Christ, we pray.